I'm so excited to be here with you today as we explore uh, accelerating digital transformation with algorithmic business thinking, um, which we will probably refer to as ABT because the full title is quite a mouthful. Um, so as Eric said, my name is Christine Gonzalez. I'm an Associate Director of Digital Deliveries at MIT Sloan Executive Education. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Paul McDonough Smith who is a senior lecturer in information technology at MIT Sloan. He's the faculty director and teaches in ABT. And he's also the MIT Sloan Office of Executive Education's digital capability leader, which he directs a growing portfolio of digital programs and works with MIT Sloan to define digital strategy and drive transformative technology experimentation. So with that, I'll pass this along to Paul, who will get us started with today's session. Paul? Well, well, th well thank, thank you, uh, Eric, and thank you, Christine. And of course, thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join Jim and I today. Uh, we're, we're very excited and, and we're looking forward to getting into uh, the, the meat of our discussion, our uh, conversation, in fact, your conversation, uh, very shortly. Uh, you'll be super pleased to hear, everybody, that I'm not going to kind of walk and, and talk you through this complete kind of bio. I'm just going to give a quick sense of, of kind of what I do here at MIT. So fundamentally, I, I wear two hats. Um, do you remember those days, everybody, where people had one job? Well, <laughs> I, I, I wear two hats here. Um, as, as Christine said, I'm a senior lecturer. And, and fundamentally, my research, my, my work, my, my teaching explores this intersect between, between computational thinking, computer science, and business thinking and business science. So a very exciting place to be right now. And then also uh, I have the, uh, the, the honor and the privilege to be the digital capability leader. And I, I suppose I, I, do, I try to do three things in this connection. Firstly, as, as Christine said, I'm responsible for our growing portfolio of asynchronous programs. Secondly, I lead our experimentation. So, you know, as you would expect uh, at MIT, but I'm sure in your organizations as well, we kind of experiment our, our, our way forward. And that involves, uh, I need to say playing, uh, perhaps it, it is playing, uh, playing around with AI, machine intelligence, digital reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, different types of robotics as, as well, to try and kind of figure out different variables in the formula for next generation teaching and learning. And the third, third part of that digital capability role is something which I'm, I'm sure is kind of near to all of your hearts, which is actually supporting our digital transformation and, and trying to figure out, trying to navigate our way through to a sustainable and robust future and a future that we want, uh, not one that we're likely just to inherit uh, from, from somewhere else. So that's, that's who I am. Um, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce you now to, to Jim. Jim, would you like to just tell us a little bit about who you are and, and what you do? Well, thanks, Paul, and, and hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Jim, and uh, you heard from Paul. I've been lucky to have known Paul for the last several years talking through this, this kind of, of vantage point on a problem. So I'm, to get to know me, and I'm not gonna read all the words there either, it would bore people to tears, and I don't want to do that. I'm a, I'm a career NASA guy, NASA for life, as my wife would say. And um, it's the only job I've ever had. It's very fortunate. I found my way to NASA. Um, my mother thought I was connected to space at birth. I'm not sure what that meant. Um, but in any event, um, I'm, I'm a NASA person, been there at NASA for 37 years. And I'm a scientist interested in that intersection between science and opportunities for doing science for the benefit of all people. And that intersects with societal benefits, economics, and some of the things that have driven NASA since the Space Act of 1958, when, when we were formed the last 60 some years. So um, my career spans a lot of things. I've flown experiments in the space shuttle, very exciting, um, to Mars. I was the first Mars chief scientist for the agency after we had a few interesting crater making events in the late 90s, um, unintentional craters, but we fixed Mars and Mars is doing great. Um, and uh, I've been lucky enough to work with a large cadre of women and men scientists throughout my career at NASA, which is just stunning. And um, today I'm, I'm lucky to be the principal investigator for the first mission back to the atmosphere of Venus and to the surface in what will be 50 years by the time we fly. Um, and so 
I bring that vantage point. I've also worked as the NASA chief scientist, um, which is kind of an interesting intersection with the leadership of, of our agency, which is exciting to me, our great administrators and their cohort, but also to the community that responds to competitions to do the business of space and earth science and technology in space. And so I'm excited about this program because that Paul has and that you're all part of because the, the business models of the future in space are rapidly evolving in the Stephen Jay Gouldian mindset. We've, we've reached those cusp points in the punctuated equilibrium and opportunity spaces are changing with digital uh, exploration opportunities and space is not only a domain of where we live, of course, but also a domain of business opportunities um, for everyone. So um, anyway, I'm excited to be here talking with Paul and you all about these things. And um, if you wanna read more about me, it's there in the blurb and you can see various things. So um, Paul, back to you. Thanks for having me. No, you're, you're, you're very welcome. The privilege and the honor is, is, is most definitely ours. And I think ladies and gentlemen, kind of the, the time has come now to kind of uh, fasten your metaphorical seatbelts. And we're, we're gonna get into, um, into this session, which I think kind of, um, not sure how to term it. Um, a webinar, yes, of course, um, technology speaking, but, but more than that, it's, it's a conversation that Jim and I want to have with all of you around, around some aspects of the things that, that Jim has just spoken about that, that are important to us and, and we think can be helpful to, to, to everybody. So let's, um, let, let's just get straight into this. What, what are we going to do? What will we do um, over the next 45 minutes? This is our uh, enablement promise to you. We, we promise that we will talk about these things and share reflections and hopefully some thought provoking ideas. We're going to introduce uh, the algorithmic business thinking, as Christine said, ABT, concept of DEFX. Now this, this actually stands for digital exploration as a forever frontier. Um, then we're going to discuss, explore the relationship of DEF, DEFX or DEFS in the case of this conversation. We're gonna discuss its relationship with space exploration and the digital economy, because we, we think there are some interesting intersect points. And then we're going to share some implications or, or help you as, as, as well, um, hopefully inspire some reflection around the implications and the relevance of DEFX to our teams and organizations today. So as, um, as Eric said at the beginning, as we go through the experience here today, please, um, please do enter any questions you have and we'll leave some time at about quarter two to, to, to actually answer a selection of those for you. Okay, so to get started here, I think it's probably wise if we um, just take one step back from, from the concept of DEF or DEFX and DEFS and, and think a little bit about what ABT actually is. Now, we're fortunate, of course, to have, to have Jim with us today. And we're going to look for those lessons, share some lessons learned that we can individually and collectively apply pretty much straight away and tomorrow into our teams. Now, this whole idea of or the whole concept of, of, of DEFX actually comes from this larger toolkit of ABT. And it's a toolkit, which you can read here, is, is actually included in an ABT suitcase. So in this suitcase, we actually pack the toolkit, uh, a mindset, and a digital language. And fundamentally, ABT tries to be a series of interconnected frameworks, models, and multidisciplinary insights that take key cornerstones of computational thinking, things like decomposition, pattern recognition, abstraction and, and algorithms, which by the way, in the case of ABT, are actually step-by-step -step instructions for humans and machines to work on problem solving together. So this idea of DEF, uh, our idea of digital exploration as a forever frontier, fits into an ABT model that we call 3E, and you, you can see it on the picture here. 
And this 3E model focuses on how exploration and experimentation can help evolve how we think and act uh, individually, in our teams, in our organizations, but, but also more broadly in society. Now, I, I think at this point, I, I should be completely transparent and, and share where DEF truly originates from. Uh, if, if it had a passport, I think on the first page, we'd see one of those big kind of stamps with NASA written all over it, because it comes from conversations I've been having with Jim over the last, the, the last few years. And in our earliest conversations, Jim taught me something that has, has very much stayed with me, that space is personal. It's personal because we're all part of it. When we talk, and when we listen to Jim and others talk about space exploration, about revisiting the moon, about going to Mars, about sending human emissaries to the surface of Venus, we're not talking about something out there. We're actually talking about something that's in here. It's actually something that's, that's part of us, that belongs to each of us. We're all part of space. We live in it as, as well. And so when Jim uh, taught me about this or explained this to me, it helped me kind of join some dots together and, and made me realize that the same can be argued for the digital economy. We're, we're part of it to a greater or lesser degree. We don't live outside of it, but within it. And as such, exploring and experimenting with its patterns can potentially help us uncover and discover opportunities to evolve our ways of thinking and acting. So let's now move from that context setting of kind of where DEF and DEFX and DEFS fits into ABT to go into DEFX itself. Now, ABT's ambition, everybody, its true ambition is to unify and unite the two worlds that we're living and operating in, the physical and the digital. It asks, perhaps even demands, that we dare to dream and to do, that we walk towards our challenges with confidence and capability. Capability that we know we're part of a bigger team, a bigger team of not just humans, but humans and machines that can allow us to almost run past the, the, the wind, to sail, sail past seas onto the stars and, and in doing so, create those futures that we want. In, in DefX, the X is meant to denote the applicability of the principles of digital exploration to each of the industries or systems that you all live and work in today. It recognizes that digital exploration's reach will always, always exceed its grasp. And do you know what? I, I think that's okay. Perhaps it's even the way it should be. The greater the progress we make, the greater the opportunities that will appear. We're never really going to reach the horizon, the, the end of a, a, a rainbow or the limit of our capabilities. If we can evolve our human and machine roles, responsibilities and relationships. And I, I don't say that just to take advantage of each of the party's individual capabilities, but very much to take advantage of their collective capa capabilities. Think about it. Think about it in the context of your own uh, work and, and workplaces. Humans and machines working together in partnership to fuel the forever frontier. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where our friends at NASA are frankly so inspirational and, and important. Their history, we might argue, actually helps map the genome of human exploration. It provides us with evidence, evidence that each one of us lives within a forever frontier. We, we saw it when the astronauts took the photograph out of, uh, out of the window of the Apollo, was it Apollo 17, Jim? Uh, 1972, the, the blue marble. Um, we, we had evidence that we're living in that forever frontier where horizons are nothing more than siren calls to our souls, our spirits and our opportunities. And so today, everybody, we're going to look at Def S or Def X through the lens of space exploration. And I suppose without going 
too much further, I, I should turn it to our guest here and, and, and really ask Jim, what does deaf S actually mean to, to you? How, how do you see it? Well, well thanks, Paul, and, and thanks for that great context framing introduction. So, so everyone, let's think about it. We, we, we live in space, we interact through space as a part of the infrastructure of a digital world now, as Paul explained. And, and that comes in various ways, of course, through telecommunications, through observation, um, and, and just through vantage points on understanding our own state of, of being on this planet. But the idea of the forever frontier that Paul and I have been talking about, um, I think engagingly for a while, really comes up as a counterpoint to the great works of science fiction we all know. So, you know, I think many know Star Trek. If you don't, well, it's okay. Um, it, it's fine. But Star Trek talked about, you know, we're, we're going to the final frontier. And as Paul said, and in business, this is something many of you have thought about. And in space exploration, we think about, there is no final frontier. There will always be another one. And it's not even horizon because even what it is changes as we learn. And so the idea behind DEV, the digital exploration, you know, as it applies to that forever frontier is that it's an ever-changing, evolving, and, and as Paul said, experimenting um, domain. And that domain will build opportunities. And some of those opportunities have taken us, quite frankly, decades to have the ability to actually take advantage of. And in the history of NASA, which I've lived, many of you have lived, going back to the first, the first wave of just accessing space, even communicating, not always digitally, ironically, but anyway, um, into the era of our first small footprints to the miracle of Apollo, probably 50 years ahead of its time, to where we are today, about to see the fruits of a 20 year uh, development in deaf space, um, which is consummated by the James Webb Space Telescope that will push the boundaries of how we see a frontier through the photons, the photons history of our accessible universe. So those things are inspiring. How do they apply to, to this frontier as it relates to domains of business? Well, I would submit to you, and we'll be talking about this, Paul and I with you, that that's where the action is because the business models of space for decades were government investment with industry through proposals to do a job, a finite tangible set of tasks in the engineering space of succeeding to return information so we learn things. And it's been extraordinarily successful, but that's changing. Access to space is changing, telecommunications is changing, situational awareness is changing, space is now a medium of exchanging information digitally. And that builds the opportunity for a digital connection, this digital exploration that we do today. And you may not realize this as we speak now, I'm getting data back from two Mars rovers that are exploring Mars in a cycle of observations, semi-autonomously producing information and sending it back to many scientists uh, around the world, women and men involved. Likewise, missions that explore the cosmos and missions to planet Earth that watch our planet. Those systems that took decades to develop are about to explode into capabilities that are opportunities for business. And not just riding along on a first ever small commercial lander somewhere, but bigger opportunities. And some of those opportunities are being uh, watched and, and taken advantage now by by billionaire space enthusiasts. And others are more organic at the level of universities and people. And that's an opportunity to use what space is best for as uh, a medium of interconnection, as Paul said, that unites us, not, it's not against us. And yes, we live in space and it's a collisional place, uh, really, at every scale of energy and, and things. And that's exciting to me, maybe a little scary to some, but that also is this wonderful opportunity. And so, you know, 150 years ago, people talked about the frontier thesis in US history and all that, and you can all read those great stories. But I think the whole concept of this frontier in the context of this particular webinar is very different. And the history books are being rewritten now as we use that, that forever frontier of space. So Paul, I'll make, turn it back to you as we converse in this arena. Thank you. And it's, listening to you speak, I'm, I'm struck by, by a number of things. One of which is 
what, what, what the concept of a forever frontier truly means in the day-to-day -day of, our, of our actions and our reactions. What, one of the ways in which I think about this is compared to um, a previous life that, that I had in, in telecoms where we would make products, we would kind of um, go through the various kind of stages. We would almost put a bow on them, send them out, have a cup of tea, you know, uh, tap ourselves on, on the back and pat ourselves on the back, etc. And um, th those days, those days completely gone. You, you speak there about kind of data being being sent from Mars rovers, everything being in this continuous kind of loop of, of, of information, insight and imp improvement. And when I hear you speak as, as, as well, I, I hear echoes of, of kind of missions past in, in, in your voice and, and missions future. You know, you've, you've mentioned things like um, Magellan, Apollo, Da Vinci already, and there, there are lots more kind of on, on the way. What, one, one thing that I remember you saying to me kind of in a recent conversation that, that I'd like to share with our, our, our friends here is, is, um, was with regard to kind of the, 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 moon, the moon landings. And, and you, you said to me that we didn't get to the moon just by going there, yeah? And that struck me as, as, as being very, very, and very interesting comments. You, you, you kind of clarified or explained to me that the tools and the capability were built to enable us to do these incredible things. And so as I think about actions and, and, and reactions, what, in a practical sense, what, what, what do we think we need to do to make DEF S actually possible? And I think in, in this regard, you and I have put together this, um, this slide and it might be a case of dividing and conquering because there's a lot on this, but would you like to make a start scene as you kind of drove it forward? Well, thanks, Paul. And, and that's a, an excellent point of departure, as you said, historically. We didn't just go to the moon. We projected technology to enable the moon to be a visitation site for humanity. And if we waited 50 years, maybe that entire exploration program would have been vicarious and digital, as things are today, when we send robots into the Titanic to watch what happened to a ship that is long lost. Uh, over 100 years ago. So this framework for discussion, this ternary diagram borrowed from, from chemistry and physics, forgive me, but it's, it's in our DNA, um, is, is a, a perspective for, exp, for explanation and discussion. And that's where I think Paul wanted to go. And so we've been using it in NASA as a way to explain ideas as a mixing ratio of, of interactions that can be uniting toward a common interest space. In this case, it could be the business model for this deaf S opportunity. Um, and as, I, as it says at the title, um, this, this digital exploration as a final frontier in space is opportunity driven. What can you do that will uh, enhance value across the metrics you have and using the tools of exploration, um, evolution, experimentation together. And we're doing that today in many ways organically. And one of the questions Paul, I think, is asking through ABT is, how can we do that better to take advantage of opportunities that we can't even see today? Because one of the challenges of the, the boundlessness, the countably infiniteness of space, as, as Def S is talking, is that you know, it, it seems so unbounding, you don't know where to start. And predictive models, business models, you may all know in your sectors, you know, that can predict uh, various metrics of value via investment and application don't always apply. You don't have infrastructure. And so I think this is an important place to begin because as Paul said, we can look back, but now let's look forward for a minute. It's one of our jobs at NASA, I think, is to be the, the inspiration in some ways, the enabler of the forward as one investment stream in, you know, in, in the business of space. Um, and there are many others, of course. And so the way I look at it is we're going back to the moon with women and machines to look at that frontier differently. We're not just exploring to see where it came from, how it relates to us, which are great science problems that I personally love. So, and, and well, uh, well studied by a recent mission that was led by MIT's Maria Zuber called GRAIL that looked inside the moon spectacularly with gravity to show us things we never would have been able to do 50 years ago, but that's science. That's science exploration to enable understanding. What about that applied exploration to enable value beyond that? And that's where this ternary diagram comes in. 
to enable the apex that's evolution there to drive greater business opportunities in that digital exploration domain that is space. So Paul, I'll stop there um, and just remind everyone, we use this kind of framework to sell and promote and develop the current uh, program of record for Mars exploration for NASA um, as a way of talking to the many different sectors involved in that investment. And so I think it, Paul, could be useful. Um, you're the expert in ABT as it applies to the domain of this webinar. Back to you. Th 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 thank you. Thank you, Jim. I'll, I'll just make um, a couple of points that, that, that I hope will be um, pragmatic and kind of pr practical kind of advantage and use to, 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 to kind of our, our participants as, as were all of your comments. And the, the, the first thing I'll, I'll kind of state is around um, the, the terminology you used is very, is very interesting here. The, the, the mixing ratios. Yeah, that, that, that's something for us to, I think, always bear in mind, irrespective of, of, of kind of our industry or um, our kind of job role or, or, or function. Um, I, I always find myself thinking about these types of problems in more evolutionary terms than revolutionary. You, you know, the, the idea of recalibration of, of kind of changing that, that, that mixing ratio. And in, in a sense, we're, we're almost, um, you know, when, when I was a child, um, play, played a lot of chess and kind of tend to see a lot of things in, in kind of chess and, and game metaphors, whether it's kind of board games or, or, or kind of video games kind of. And if we think about the technology chessboard that we're, we're currently, currently kind of sitting upon, um, we, we've only really just entered perhaps into the second half of that, that, that technology ch chessboard. Uh, there, there are moves to be made, there are interconnections, interdependencies between the different pieces. Um, I, I just want to draw attention to a couple of points here up under business model, uh, the, the, the perils of prediction, um, not, not confusing prediction and decision making, yeah, um, but be, being very aware that kind of the ground can shift from underneath our feet, as I think uh, one of your recent experiments um, kind, kind of shown us, and you can maybe reference that in, in, in just a moment. But th this idea of being um, exploration based about, about being flexible to the what ifs from, from a deaf S perspective, the, 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 the what ifs can be very far reaching, of course. Um, you've opened my eyes to a number of them from a, a, a biological, a microbiological perspective of what, what may we find when we go to certain places and what, what happens if we do find certain unexpected um, th things. Um, what does the actual trajectory in the journey, what, what are we learning from that? And then how do we apply those patterns into other areas? I'm, I'm, I'm interested as, as well, you, you mentioned about the data from um, the, 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 the Mars rovers. Um, you've also referenced the James Webb uh, Space T Telescope. And I, I think those are almost um, aug augmenting our human senses uh, in the sense that we can see further into the universe. We can see, you mentioned the Titanic, deeper into the oceans. Um, and with that aug augmentation, the, the plug and play nature of our cognitive processes where we, we, we sense things, we, um, we, we take that data, we internalize it, we, come, we make a decision, we have a reaction, we do things. It's going to be interesting as, as the data and the sensors change, um, the way in which our processes and the opportunities that actually opens to us. So, so I think open innovation architectures, open network kind of systems are going to be very important. And across those networks, for, for want of a better, um, more eloquent kind of expression, I, I feel a, a common language for, for stakeholders, but not only stake, stakeholders, including all of the participants, all of the nodes in those net networks. Uh, I, I like what Noam Chomsky, the MIT uh, professor emeritus said, that the principal, the principal function of language isn't to, to communicate, but rather to link interfaces. Um, I'm, I may be kind of stretching uh, his, his, his point here, but if we think about the interfaces as not being only human, but being human and machine and machine to machine, uh, it gets very, very interesting when you talk about the extension of, of our uh, realities of the different dimensions, whether that be the physics of Earth, of uh, low Earth orbits, uh, deeper space, etc. We're going to have to have business models that are able to, um, to move between these realities and these physics. So I say all of this, not, not in a tone of voice of kind of a of fear or trepidation, but the kind of, wow, a sense of wonder. We're a little bit like those guys in the 1780s hopping on those hot air balloons and, and, 
<laughs> and kind of looking down at the earth and kind of understanding things uh, in, in, in different ways. Funnily enough, by undertaking kind of deaf, deaf S and, and practicing deaf S principles, perhaps we won't only learn more about what to do in those different dimensions, but what to do actually in the dimension in which we exist currently. So, so, so I think opportunity driven versus challenge kind of um, impeded is, is a very nice way to, to, to be looking at all of these things. And it, it, actually, it, it actually leads me to think a little bit about some of the research and some ABT research that we're conducting uh, around the creation of a periodic table of digital and human elements. It's um, the, the, the basic idea fundamentally with this has been to borrow and build on the work of Mendeleev um, back in 1869 when he published his first version of the, uh, the, the periodic table of, of, of elements. What, what he was fundamentally trying to do, I believe, was to, was to create order around the confusion in, in the world of, of, of chemistry. And I think with the periodic table of digital and human elements, we're trying to do something similar with the, or for the, the digital economy. We, we hear a lot, of, um, a lot of talk and a lot of vocabulary, things like digital disruption, but, but perhaps what, why not, to your point in the previous slide around opportunities, why not think of this as digital eruptions, yeah, the digital possibilities, digital kind of um, digital places and, and, and spaces that we can, we can explore. And intrinsically linked to this idea of um, a periodic table of digital and human elements, which I, I shan't bore you here, um, but you, you can view it in other webinars we've done. We, we actually have um, approximately 100 elements in, in this table now, 70 of which are digital and 30, just above 30, are, are, are human. And intrinsically kind of linked to, to all of these ideas of a periodic table is the concept of compound innovation, where fundamentally, we're looking to create robust, sustainable molecules where human elements and machine elements are combined, you know, where they have ionic bonds holding them together and actually gives us the opportunity to think in, in kind of almost a double helix term of, well, when we're building a technology solution, which are the human elements we require and vice versa, when we're building a human solution, are we certain around, or have we been thinking correctly about the technology components that we need to build in? And I think here, it makes me think, just to give you some examples of, of that compound innovation, interested in the idea of AI with creativity, uh, VR with curiosity, coding with compassion, and, and perhaps above all, human and digital elements working in that idea of consilience, of unity and unification. And this idea of humans and machines working together, I suppose it leads me into the next question, Jim, which is how do you see Def S recalibrating human and machine relationships in the near, in the near to next term? Well, Paul, and, that, and that's a, a beautiful segue. And it's, how do I see it? It's, it's more, how do I not see it, to be frank, because those, those paradigms that we've learned, I should say, in fits and starts in this connectivity, this unity, as Paul talked about, between ourselves and the machines that enable us to do the things in the places, quite frankly, we shouldn't go, but that we may need to be for the purposes of whatever value metric we have. It might be taking advantage of a resource in space that we don't have here on Earth. And just remember, folks, I can pick up a rock on the moon that is essentially an ore body that we would mine on Earth that was just lying at the feet of astronauts on the Apollo missions. That's the difference between our nearest natural satellite and our own world. Not that we don't have interesting places like that on Earth. So I think, Paul, um, your, your idea of the recalibration in the context of DEFS is really important because the change that is coming, that this digital um, exploration age has enabled and, and the digital economy that goes with it, um, is ready for space. It's not there. We don't have a space internet or whatever other cute term you use. Um, we don't. But in order to take advantage of what space offers, we need that digital exploration, um, what should I say? System of systems is the term we would use at NASA to enable it to happen. So for example, as we return to the moon with women 
and machines and other explorers, entrepreneurs, um, the idea of a very different kind of network of interactions between people and machines at all different path lengths, scales, delay tolerances, information flows is going to be important. And this is something that we care about at NASA as just one of the agents of growing that new, if you will, as a lunar economy of some sort, yeah. because we need that kind of network. We need to allow places for all of those players to use the moon um, capably and favorably as a target for benefit of humanity, of society, for the good of all, to be a uniter in many ways. Um, it's no longer one government going there one time. It's everyone being there all the time. And we used to talk um, 20 years ago about the idea of, you know, in space going anywhere, anytime. Now, of course, you know, physics does dictate that may be a little challenging, even, you know, to the great science fiction writers. So, but imagine that digital exploration with this, this recalibration of those relationships allows us to virtually do that. And that some of the exploration we do to gain value in learning, um, the situational awareness we do will be totally digitally enabled. And so the kids in the classrooms as part of the digital learning you're experiencing in this webinar are virtual explorers on the moon to see another world as they could be on the seafloor or atop the great mountain peaks of our planet or at the poles. So the responsibilities of this are important because they're coming. We won't be able to stop them. In some sense, this DFS domain is growing organically beneath us by virtue of the investments made over the last decades. And so the next decade is going to be a critical time, Paul, I think, of evolutionary change, perhaps with certain paradigm shifts. And those will be particularly important, not just as we explore space and learn new stuff in the domain I'm used to, but in the domain of all of you in this webinar as you take advantage of the opportunities that presents. And so, and I'll finish with this, Paul, um, those, those relationships will be even more integrated than we imagine today with our cell phones and our, you know, digital, uh, port, uh, what should I say, our digital portals for our health benefits and all that. They will be more integrated because the places we will be going ourselves and projecting our digital partners into will be more challenging, more difficult, and, and more learning possible. And the example I'll give, just because I know it easily, is going back to the atmosphere of Venus into a place where environments change very rapidly to be unlivable and not easily sustainable, even by the limits of the technologies we have. And that's why no one's been back for 50 years. To go there as an exploring step, to understand what's there as a place of value for learning, but also for potentially figuring out the, the other benefits is an important example. Um, we do the same in the deep sea floor where the deepest, um, I don't know, several percent have not even been fully explored at the scale that we people would want to. So those are opportunity spaces for learning and in learning and having the digitally connectivity tools to do those things, we will be able to do new things. Look for life in crazy places. People are positing life that could live in cloud states on, on worlds not in the way we think of life here on earth as we are, but microbial life systems that adapt to environments like that, which we will be able to sense indirectly through the next wave of astrophysical observatories like James Webb and beyond. We'll be able to sense the implications of them. And so we need to understand that here. But anyway, to your point, Paul, and I'll turn it back over to you because I love the digital expression at the bottom. Um, it, you know, it, it, I would have preferred hexadecimal, but that's my <laughs> Um, sorry about that. So anyway, my, my point is that these connectivities are rapidly changing, becoming more, um, uh, what should I say, more combinatorial. And so we need them to do any job we do. If I want to look inside uh, a rock to understand its resource potential, and I do an x-ray computer tomography scan and generate 100 gigabytes of information, I want the machine learning to tell me what's valuable rapidly so I am in the decision loop, but not the person doing all the work. And that's just a connectivity of sensing that we can use today across all these domains. And as we go to space, it becomes more and more important because most of the space environment we go to, Paul, and everyone <clears throat> is not necessarily human friendly. And the systems we go there with have to allow us to extend ourselves there 
against environmental conditions that of course the engineers that do this understand well, that are just not like those nice conditions we have here on our wonderfully habitable earth. So that's my point, Paul. I, th I think it's, there's, well, there's, there's an awful lot in, in, in there to potentially un unpack. I'm just gonna pick a, a couple of things that, uh, you know, if I, um, it, this may seem like a strange metaphor, but if, if I were to kind of blow up a, a, a balloon to, to, to represent kind of, you know, the, the trajectory and the journey from 1957 to, 20, you know, 100 years of, of kind of NASA, exploration, um, you know, if I may, kind of dated back to, I think, was it 57 Sputnik and, and, and what have you. I, th I think it, there's um, a value in our own, in each of our organisations as, as, as well, to kind of look back, to look forward a, a tiny bit here, to, to have a sense of historical context. No, no, no doubt we're all caught up in the day to day and kind of the urgency of, 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 of everything, um, really. But, but I've, I've always kind of admired the, 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 the idea of a, a mission yeah, in, in the sense of the the the, the Apollo and, and and other other kind of missions that, that that were staged that had kind of you know different one one high level kind of objective and and, and, a, and a series of kind of activities to 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 actually make it possible, um, learning from each one to enable the next, etc. And I'm particularly um, inspired and, and kind of curious around the ways in which by kind of um, going to these new places, sending human emissaries to kind of uh, back, back to the surface of Venus for the first time in, in, in 50 years, et cetera, that the ways in which the plug and play nature of this, the, the experience that we can have will fundamentally change our reality and in some ways almost our consciousness, the, the, the way that we think about things, not just within that domain, but kind of more broadly, uh, societally, and perhaps even um, in terms of our problem solving and decision making. And it, it makes me kind of think not just about the toolkit or the digital language, but also the mindset that, that, that I, without wishing to embarrass you or your, your colleagues, think that to a great degree you, you've helped inspire over the, the, the period since, since 1957 of, of kind of what's actually possible about, about things being possible and how to actually approach very complex and, and complicated problems. When, 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 I, when I think about the mindset from an organizational perspective within the digital economy that, that I hope to a degree is, I think perhaps is translatable to the, 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 the space environment as well, is, is kind of this need to, to, to move, not just move past or move from um, hierarchical command and control types of structures to more decentralized ones based on collaboration, cultivation, cooperation, etc. But, but to kind of go past those, forge past them to approaches for leadership and management that, that actually embrace exploration and engagement. And, and by that, I mean being willing to let go of kind of things that we've learned and that were true, but are now longer kind of pertinent and being able to replace them with kind of the new things that we're learning and to, to kind of embrace that whole journey of continuous kind of um, deep development and evolution. And so the, the, the question that, that I pose to you really on, on behalf of uh, attendees here is from a leadership and management perspective uh, and or even cultural perspective, what, what are the things that we need to develop to be able to embed DFS type of thinking into our organizations, Jim? So, so Paul, I think there's a few, and I'm just one person, by the way, and, and I, I think many of my colleagues who have been in the space business would, would provide other rich inputs to this. So I'll give you one person's view, just to, to be fair. So I think the first thing is the, an, a sense of agility. And I think that's where DFS comes to mind. That adaptability to an unknown as part of a development process. And you know, as we think of, of what we do, sometimes we think of, of bringing the solution to a problem. And sometimes you have to invert that and think of, in fact, bringing the, the problem to a solution in, in order to get the overall solution that you want. So I know that sounds cryptic and I'm not trying to be off-putting here. Um, so I think, Paul, the, the biggest example is, you know, leadership of one of a kind missions of whatever, you know, we call them moonshots or other terms inherited from history, really, um, you know, is one kind of management. But in the business domain, that's, that's not the typical one. There's not all moonshots. There's sustainability of a product line or, a, you know, a, a value added product or whatever, the deliverable that makes 
the value for the organization in your in your sector. And and that's a different kind of management. That's a management that's adaptable and agile enough in this digital exploration forever frontier to make those adjustments because they are always necessary. Some of the one-off missions that we talk about took a decade or two to build because of those adjustments in building a one-off. But once you've done the one-off, the value of this, of this forever frontier idea is not having to repeat all of that, as you just said, but to build on the foundation that was learned. And so today, the heat shields that allowed Apollo astronauts to return to the earth safely, to tell their story so well as, as you know, Jim Lovell and Jack Schmidt and the other great colleagues have done so often for us. Um, once we got it right, the great physicists and engineers, we didn't have to reinvent it, we used it. Once we develop an idea and a paradigm in this digital um, exploration world that we live in, we can apply it again. And we can apply it, as you said, Paul, decentralized, so we are more adaptable. And to me, one of the things space in this DEFS framework is so exciting about it, it's a great frontier domain for experimentation. Mm -hmm. Experimentation on the business investment side, as many of your organizations may do. And that investment in a future that you can't quite see, but you want to enable, um, as great success stories can explain, is really important. So what do, you, what do we have in this big boundless um, space domain to use? We have an opportunity to try new things away from pitfalls we may have trying them in our backyard. That's one thing. Um, and also for benefits that we don't need here to live well in our backyard, yes. because we're fine. We're eating, we're watching shows, we're dancing and skating and whatever sport you like. A lot of my paradigms, Paul, are, are hockey, not chess. So it's a little more collisional. But that's okay. It's still strategic. So I think that's that opportunity space allows experimental catalytics to be part of this digital exploration frontier. And so what do we need? We want to capture the benefits of, of the quantum domain in engineering and computing. We want to benefit um, and use the value of the explosive new techniques and biological um, toolkits that have enabled great new vaccines to be developed rapidly. We want to use those things. But then there's the other side of things that we don't understand. The opportunities at that forever frontier through deaf S using space mm. away from seven odd, eight odd billion people is incredible one. It gives us a laboratory to explore for value, not just for the purposes of one-offs to great worlds that we want to understand, but to be everywhere where we can take advantage of it. And that's that's great. We have the space in space to use it intelligently as, as this digital exploration frontier, this deaf ass. And so in management, how do we build the tools to do that, as you just said in your next slide? And that's the question I pose to you, Paul. Back to you. No, no, it's th 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 thank you. The, 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 the key message, some of the key messages I pull out of that for, for, for everybody really is the, the, the agility, the adaptability, that the pattern recognition, um, and, and again, it goes back to perhaps where, where, where I started around this intersect of computational thinking and, and, and business thinking. When, when, when programming, what, what, once you have kind of code that works to do a particular job, you'll, you'll reuse it. So keeping your eyes open for the patterns of success and failure within your problem set, but, but also more broadly. Now, ju just conscious of time, because we want to leave some, some time, Jim, for uh, some questions. So we have one, one further slide. And, Crikey, I think we could have, uh, you know, le lessons learned and lessons to be learned. We could have, we could have written a hundred slides about, about this. Just, just pulled a, a few here. So, out of the out of the three that we have, um, any any comments you'd like to make about any of, of these or any other lessons that that you've learned you've, you've learned along your kind of DFS journey? Well, uh, my biggest one is in the center because it's a catchphrase that I think bespeaks how we work at, at, in all these frontiers, Paul and, and everyone, and, and never waiting to wonder, it doesn't just apply to our curiosity driven, you know, interest in science or whatever. I mean, music, dance, art, it, it doesn't matter the domain. Um, and, and I think that captures an optimism, a uniting hope, Paul, that, that sometimes we use. And I think DEFS and DEFX really is all about that, that we can, we can use that to attack new problems, you know, in a hopefulness. And the new 
digital economy has taken advantage of that. We see it in the last 20 years of that, of that digital connectivity age that we all live in and that many of you work in. And so I think never waiting to wonder because what can we do now? You know, we can mine the petabytes of data to learn something. Um, we can generate, generate terabits a minute about a problem to explore it in a way that 20, 30, 40 years ago was not part of a business solution or even a capability space. How do we take advantage of those things and put them together? Um, and so uh, all of these are good lessons. I think the never wait to wonder is something that I, you know, I feel is important to the human condition as, as we do our jobs in business and explore. And so we see that lesson in space all the time as we do our sometimes one of a kinds and sometimes others. So that's my message um, just from my limited experience. And I think many of us would have others. So over to you, Paul. No, th th thank you. And I, I would translate that. I, I, you know, I find it very inspiring as, as well. Uh, I would translate that never wait to wonder to almost a, a digital presentism, uh, not waiting for tomorrow to kind of be begin the, the, the journeys that we, you know, very, very often the hardest part about going to the gym is actually putting your running shoes on. <laughs> so, so actually getting, getting started with, with things. And I, I think super important as, as well, the, the point that you make around the, the optimism, the positivity, um, the almost a, a, a lightness of um, a lightness of spirit with a seriousness of intent. If, if, you, if you if you see what I mean, that um, just because something is complex and complicated doesn't mean that we we can't approach things with a light-hearted, open mind and even perhaps a smile on our face at times and celebrate the, the possibilities and the potential. So, really, with that, can, can I ask um, you know, Christine uh, if you have any if any questions have been sent in? If there's uh, any any kind of from our, our friends who've attended today yeah we do have some questions thank you so much both that was wonderful um i noticed on a few of the slides that there's a line of what looks like binary code at the bottom is this an error or does it mean <sighs> yeah, I, th I think jim you you referred to this you, you you kind of wanted hexadecimal kind of yeah um bit bit, bit too tricky for me so so i just went with binary it's um it's not, it's just meant to be a bit of an Easter egg, just, just a bit of a joke as we go through this, um, representing the word explore. Okay, so the, the kind of those, the zero and one dots actually represent uh, explore as, as, a, as, as, as a word in English. Okay, so thank, thank, thank you for the, for the question. We, we can't resist, um, you know, hacking things and throwing things in here at MIT. That's great. Paul, um, I heard you speak before about ABT and its double helix model that connects physical and digital worlds we operate in. How do you see that double helix evolving with DEFS? Two, two, two things, I suppose. I, I mentioned briefly before, kind of uh, as, just as an example, kind of AI with creativity, um, digital realities with curiosity, coding with, 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 with compassion. I don't think any of the technology components there, their, their full potential can be anywhere near realized without the equivalent kind of or supportive human elements to help unlock and kind of um, make them kind of um, make them stick, make them more robust, more, make them more sustainable. And, and then we need to be agile with this because who knows, um, as, as we kind of make these further journeys with DEFS, as, as we learn more, we're, we're like the periodic table that Mendeleev put together, that, that there are gaps, there are going to be new elements discovered, there are going to be new experiences, um, our realities will kind of merge, evolve, who, who knows? So, so we have to be in the moment a tiny bit and just do what evolution does, adapt. Yeah. Okay. Um, Great. This next one is for both of you. What would you both say is the key leadership takeaway from DEFAS? <laughs> Jim? Well, thanks. Um, for asking me. I think the key leadership thing is that open-mindedness um, and optimism. And I know that those are trite catchphrases and all that, but, but as we push digital exploration into forever frontiers, you know, we, we have to be ready for those opportunities. And I think Churchill said that even in the darkest hour, a sense of optimism is the only way to go in some better ways than I just quoted him. And I think that's important. We look at problems that seem unbounded and impossible sometimes. And, you know, it is, as Paul said before, you don't put your running shoes on and so you're not going to the gym. So you're not taking advantage of the opportunity. The opportunities are there. And so in a management sense, seizing them with an optimism 
using the benefits of digital uh, of this digital exploration capability space and the digital economy and the connectivities that are growing in front of us will give us the tools to solve them. ABT is one of that of the part of the toolkit for doing that. And I think that's expressed in what some of the things we're trying to do to open that space frontier for everyone now uh, across the, the space government sectors as just one little input to it. So um, I'm so bullish about it as a tool to help us all even better understand how to live on our own planet. So I hope that is a short answer that helps. Paul? Yeah, I've, I've, got, I've got two kind of very, very short things to say, kind of um, enjoy the journey, kind of trite perhaps, but kind of um, not, not, not be defined by destinations, but kind of enjoy, enjoy the journey. And then um, on, on a personal and collective kind of level, um, don't, don't let anybody else set your kind of limitations or your ambitions or your hopes, dreams, desires, everything else. N nobody has the right to do that. You decide kind of. Uh, and yeah, we talked about moonshots. M maybe things might seem a bit far from kind of where you are now, but kind of going back to the chess thing, five, making five or six of the right moves can, can, can kind of take you to some pretty cool places. Yeah. So don't, don't lose faith. Don't lose confidence in, in, in what you're doing. And, you know, keep, keep, keep looking forward. Keep moving. <laughs> keep going that's great this has been a really inspiring session um so uh we, we uh, conscious of time uh we'll take questions and we'll address them in, in a later time in a blog post i just want to leave another minute or so for paul and jim if you have any closing remarks or anything you want to share to kind of wrap up this session okay can i go first kind of jim just super super quickly and it's it's simply to say thank you okay and uh Thank you for, for the work that you and your organization do. Thank you for spending the time to help me understand it, for sharing it with us today. Um, we're, we're all kind of better positioned. Thank, thanks to those, that, those that, the generosity that you've shown. Thank you. Well, Paul, thank you all for listening to all of us who pursue that, that forever frontier in space and, and for listening to <laughs> um, NASA lifers like me um, pontificate a bit. Um, I would say the op, something I would like to share with everyone, the next, we always say this, but the next 10 years in that forever frontier of space are going to be a roller coaster ride that will be like none we've seen probably till the first earliest wave of, of the access to space, you know? And so it, space belongs to all of us. It's an inclusive domain. And this digital exploration opportunity, the toolkits, these paradigms we've been talking about there to be applied by all of us. It presents, um, I think, an extremely exciting time for us to take advantage because I think we'll wake up in the 2030s with these digital connectivity tools and possibilities, new classes of astronauts, women and men working with machines and, and new, if you will, digital um, programming tools that may take advantage of, of quantum aspects and whatever, that will be astounding. And we'll say, geez, why didn't we have this before? The same way we look back and think, you know, why didn't I have an internet and an iPhone when I was in grad school? Because I didn't. And, you know, it's, it's just an explosive opportunity. And so, you know, uh, never waiting to wonder also means seize the moment because it's there. And I know in tough times with all the things we're leading um, here on our limited resource planet, space does offer um, a, a digital forever frontier that we can, can use for our own benefit. So I hope thanks to all of you, we can, we can go after it together. That'll make it great. But again, thanks for having me. Thanks, Paul, for engaging in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, th and thank you, everybody, for kind of taking the time to join us. Uh, it's been lovely to spend time with you. Thank you.